Okay, so we have Gail Dugan. Uh, he said he wouldn't be able to attend, but just in case, I'll call his name. Pam McQueer. Laura Ogar. If you guys are in attendance, please speak up. Uh, Bradley Benman. Oh, I don't, don't see him either. Charlie Schlinger. Kelly, I heard from Charlie Schlinger. He is on his way back to Michigan, but he is not going to be able to attend tonight. OK. Uh, Leah Daiga. Sandy Winstow. I'm here. Patty Baldwin. Tyler Essenberg. Yep, here Kelly, thank you. Awesome. Ken Harvey. I'm here. Lynn McIntosh. I am here. Elizabeth Huptman. I'm here, thanks. Bob Hockey. Richard Burns. David Wynn. I'm here. Margaret Brum. Uh, Brad, we're doing roll call. I see you just came in, so I'm going to mark you as here. Daniel Burlingame. Matt Farah. Jeremy Welsh. Mary Blanchard. Here. Stacy Taylor. Christina Schroeder. I'm here. Thank you. Tony Spaniola. I'm here. Thanks. Uh, Jeffrey Dutton. Rick Radisky. Here. Shelly Thurston. Here. Daniel Brown. Here. Bo Kang. I'm here. Bill Creel. I'm here. David Norwood. Teresa Landrum. She's here. Connie Boris. I'm here. Justin Patak. And Bill Barnett. Okay, that's 34 members. And All right. You want me to keep going there? Was there yep. any more account? All right. So we're going to do the agenda a little different. We thought this um, week um, because I know there's going to be some good discussion about uh, the biosolid issue that came up as well as the public notification. So I think we wanted to start 
with some subcommittee reports. Um, so we were going to start with the engaging the public subcommittee. I don't know who wants to speak on that behalf. Oh, look at there. Speak. All right, go okay. ahead. Take it away. All right. We had our meeting at uh, five o'clock and of course, I started out by talking about biosolids and my concerns and how that had been an issue way back in 2017 going forward here in northern Kent County. And we were assured that that would be thoroughly covered at this meeting. So we went on and talked about the memo and uh, saw some of the positive points in there, but there were still some issues that, that, that need to be addressed. And so that probably will come out in this meeting as well. So that's what I have to report and I'm glad to be back. Sorry, I missed the uh, last couple meetings. Thank you. We're glad to have you back. Um, Rick, was there anything that you were going to bring up in that? From last uh, month? No, we, we uh, just, uh, we, we discussed a number of items in the previous meeting and we kind of honed in on uh, the uh, Michigan manufacturer's letter and then we kind of decided to put that off waiting to the, respond to the uh, MPART uh, memo. So um, yeah, what, what Ken said was uh, accurate, so. All right, I just wanted to make sure everybody, that we were all straight. Any comments or questions for Ken or that subcommittee? All right, we'll move on to the next one. The um, website review subcommittee. Any anything? Uh, yes, Sandy, this is Bill Creel. Um, we had our meeting at 430 today and um, welcome to Rick Radisky and Brad Benman to the subcommittee. Great to have you guys on. Uh, between those, the three of us and Dan Brown, we took a look at the new map tool that's up on the website and overall the subcommittee thought that map tool is a very good tool has a lot of data in it uh, may be overwhelming and um, we know they're going to add the fish tissue data in also uh, we just had a few minor comments on it nothing major um, and we had a good discussion on those uh, for the next meeting we're going to take a look at the pfos 101 videos that are on the website and uh, see if we see how those look to us and if we have any comments on those. That's it. That's good. All right. Anybody have comments for the website review? All righty. Uh, preventative measures subcommittee. Yeah, <clears throat> um, we currently have had uh, five meetings uh, from this measure subcommittee. Uh, we currently have our sixth meeting scheduled for the 23rd of February at 6 p.m. Um, the group has talked about a, discussing a multitude of issues relative to everything from list, pro, list of products that contain PFAS PFOS free products. Um, we've talked about legislation um, that's either currently passed in other states as well as uh, proposals that are in the Michigan legislature right now on banning certain types of um, products that have PFOS in them. Um, we've talked about you know active uh, landfills and then uh, trying to look at possibility of putting together a list for any closed landfills. Uh, which is probably going to be a pretty substantial task to take on. Um, but right now, the main thing we've all focused on right now is um, currently two things. Um, our main focus right now needs to be what we're going to call turning off the tap, which is current, um, you know, you know, material and, and PFOS products as of today. And one of the first things that we want to create is we want to create a mission statement um, that lets local communities and state legislatures 
know that there, there are goals and objectives are, we're aiming towards for safer PFAS free environment, as well as human health in Michigan. Um, and then the second thing is we need to generate specific listings of products that contain PFAS as well as listing of PFAS free products that can be distributed to local communities and state government uh, for educating people on those items and the do's and don'ts uh, that pose potential environmental and human health risks um, as they relate to PFAS today. Um, right now, we currently, for the meeting that we're having on the 23rd, uh, I've hit, sent out an email um, requesting some feedback on uh, getting everybody's input on the mission statement or what our goals, you know, we want to establish that mission statement or goal. Uh, so I'm looking for that kind of impact that we can have a discussion on our meeting on the 23rd, um, as well as any listings um, for products uh, that contain PFOS as well as PFAS free products. So we're working, trying to get everybody's input and there, I've gotten some emails on, on materials um, on both, uh, but I'm looking for a lot more. Uh, so if anybody uh, has any listings that they can provide, I'd like to do that. I also wanna mention, uh, I wanna thank Mike Jury because I contacted Mike Jury, uh, who seems to have had a lot of, in, a lot of background um, in PFAS products listed with PFAS. Mike has been very helpful in sending me a lot of information uh, that I've shared with the group uh, relative to websites and information on products that contain PFOS as well as PFOS free products. So again, Mike Jury, I want to thank Mike Jury for, for that support. And that's it. Thanks, Dave. That's good. That's a it's a daunting task. I know that from sitting <laughs> on that committee. We were getting overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, Lynn, did you have your hand up? Um, yes, I did. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I wanted to express my gratitude, Dave, for you stepping forward and getting this going. It is so encouraging to me. I really like the, the simple title, Turning Off the Tap. And um, so for and everyone who's on that committee, this is this is really great. So that's all. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And Mike Jerry says more to come. So be prepared. Get your inbox ready for more stuff. I'm ready. Tell um, them I'm ready. Okay. Um, anything else for prevention? I would assume to all those subcommittees, if if people are interested in joining that haven't, they're probably more than welcome to. So absolutely, to would, um, I encourage uh, I encourage that any any input from anyone, because uh, like I said, trying to put together these lists of products uh, that contain PFOS as well as PFOS free products is a monumental task. Yeah, it it is. So. Thanks, All right. Andy. Any other, any other comments or questions or ideas? Lynn, your hand's still up, but I think, I think you just don't know how to put it down. There you go. Okay. Um, on to the membership committee. You guys were quite busy, so who who's gonna speak for the membership committee? Mary, maybe? Yep, I guess I will. Um, okay. I'd like to thank all the members who uh, submitted their surveys and also thank uh, Daniel and Joe for their help with that. And um, I think the results turned out pretty well as far as getting a read for how people are feeling about things. And I, I just want to thank Mary. You know, Mary put in a lot of a lot of work. You know, pulled the document together, uh, spent a lot of time on on that, and and you know, guided uh, both Joe and I um, to reach out to people and everything. So kudos to Mary for for really being the the conductor. Hey, we that. got the team effort going. <laughs> so, do you want to talk a little about what you found in the survey, or how many members we have, or any of that? 
Well, um, I, I did think it was um, three people asked to be removed and Kelly did that. Um, other than that, I was surprised that most people responded. In fact, 22 people responded that they do frequently attend the meetings. And that was one thing that I don't know about other people, but when you look at the uh, bottom of the screen, when you're seeing the circles there, you don't always know exactly how many people are attending. So I thought that was encouraging that that many people were attending. Um, 29 people did um, express that they were active members. And the other thing that I thought was interesting to me was the comment and suggestion section at the bottom. Um, I, I think people did express their honest feelings about it and where we take it as a cog, I'm not sure. But uh, if anybody has not read it, they might want to read that through because I think uh, people offered their honest thoughts there. And then the other thing, uh, I think uh, Connie was going to speak more on the leadership nominations, maybe. All right, Connie, are you are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, what we're looking to see, uh, we put a, together a list of people. Uh, unfortunately, I should have printed it off and I didn't, so I apologize for that. But we're looking if anybody else is interested, if you could let us know by the end of this meeting, if you're interested in running for the positions are chair, first vice chair, and second vice chair, and it would be on a rotating basis. So say, for example, one person is chair, serving as chair would maybe run three or four meetings, and then it would pass on to the first vice chair and so on. So if anybody is interested in running, please, please let us know. We already have a ballot uh, drafted up. You will vote for no more than three people. And the, the, three, the three people that have the most votes, the one with the most votes will become chair, second most votes would be first vice chair, and third most votes would be the second vice chair. So it, could I hear if anybody at all is interested to having their name put on the nominee list so we can add it to the ballot? Because we got quite a few people here and uh, you know, you can always throw your hat in a ring and uh, get active and participate. So is there anyone else? Uh, you can think about it during this, this meeting too. And right toward the end before we uh, close the meeting, if you say, hey, I'm really interested, put my name on the list, put my name on the ballot, we'll do it. You could also put it in the chat, I'm guessing, if you'd like. Put it where, Sandy? In the, in the chat. Oh, yeah, put it in the chat. That's good, too. I didn't think of that. That's good. Sure. OK, that's uh, pretty much what we're thinking about on the voting. Uh, the actual voting after this meeting is completed or adjourned, what we will do is draft, revise the ballot we have right now, and then the membership committee will send out the written ballot. And then we ask that two weeks from today would be the deadline for returning it back to the membership committee, which will probably be Mary, uh, Mary, if uh, you'd be taking in all of the ballots. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, good. So that would be on the 22nd uh, that it would be due. And that gives us another two weeks to prepare, you know, for the upcoming uh, March COG meeting. So I think two weeks is a fair deadline. 
All right, so that's that's about it for the uh, nominee and the voting deadline date, which again, as I said, be February 22. All right. That's it, Sandy. All right. Um, so I guess, I mean, it's open for discussion. If, if people have thoughts or ideas on that, different ways they want to do it, more information they need, let's have that conversation now. Everybody got shy tonight. All right, Daniel, did I see your hand up? All right, go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to second what Mary was suggesting. You know, if you haven't had a chance to read the comment section on the survey results, yeah, I, I encourage everybody to do that. There's there's a lot in there. There's a lot of nuance. Um, so I don't I don't think any one of the three of us want to try to summarize or or speak for you know what the uh, consensus is or you know try to try to summarize all of that into a few comments. But it, it's worth everybody reading through just to get a sense of. Uh, where we are and and what uh, you know what everybody hopes to get out of out of this team going forward. All right, um, and that was sent out to everybody, I think. So if you need another copy of that to review the comment section, they can ask Mary. I'm guessing. Absolutely, be happy okay. to. And the email, right. I, the email that I just sent out to members with the slides, that is a updated COG member list. So not copying from previous emails, copy from that email and that should be your member distribution list. Got it. Um, Abby, you got your hand up? Um, just a quick question, quick question before we uh, leave this topic. I know last month there was some um, discussion about people potentially uh, introducing themselves or saying a few words. I don't know, and maybe Kelly can put the list back up of the people who were um, potentially going to take membership uh, leadership spots. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows everybody that's on that list or if there's some um, need, but I guess that was something that we had dis discussed in the last meeting. I just wondered if you guys had thoughts on it. My feeling is let's just go forward without, uh, I think we're going to be delayed if we're going to do short bios and that kind of thing. Uh, remember, this is rotating and... I just don't like to see any more delay. I really want to get moving on this. If we do a short bio, that's going to delay things. And I don't think that's really needed. That's my personal opinion. Anybody else's opinion, just chime in. Yeah, I was going to say, any other thoughts about that? I do remember that coming up as part of the discussion before. I, I guess the other option would be if you have questions about people's bios, you could always reach out to them um, on email and ask a little bit more about them if you're not familiar with kind of where they're from or the story or whatever, if that would be an option too. All right, well, thank you, membership committee. You guys did a, a lot of work in a short amount of time, so good job. Um, anything else about subcommittees before we move on? Yeah, Sandy, I just had one thought that uh, it, maybe it's more toward Bill Creel's group, but if one of the things about the MPART website is there's no interaction if you have a comment or a question. And I'm wondering if there could be another tab that just says comments. 
And for example, one of the comments might be, would you please update all of the MPART sites in Wayne County or something to that effect? Now, I know that means more work. So we're also thinking maybe the COG should be a part of that group. I don't know. It's just that there's no interaction. It's all one way. And you don't get to interact. You don't get to say, well, gee, these lab results are from 2019. How about something from 2021? So I just wonder if there would be a way to make it a little bit more interactive. But it's just a thought. I'm just laying it on the table because right now it's just one way. That's all. Just a thought. Okay, Sandy, that's, that's it. <laughs> Bill, are you still on? Yeah, I'm still here. <clears throat> um, I guess we can talk uh, at the next subcommittee meeting, put that on the agenda and talk a little bit with um, uh, MPARTS about the thoughts on that, where they are, and maybe come back with some. Great. Perfect. All right. Any other subcommittee questions, comments, things? Recipes. Recipes. All right, so let's move on to the next thing, which I think, Abby, were you guys going to talk about the update us on the biosolids issue? Yeah, thanks, Sandy. Um, so yeah, want to give you guys, um, obviously we talked uh, week ago ish um, about this the uh, situation over in Livingston County with a particular farmer wanted to give you guys some additional background to kind of set the stage for um, that situation and some of the historical work that we've already done and so I've asked uh, Stephanie Kamer she's our section um, section unit chief for the emerging pollutants section. And so Stephanie's gonna walk you through a lot of the historical stuff. I've asked her to try to keep it short. So she's gonna kind of cram a lot into um, a short amount of time, but there's a lot of information on our website and in a lot of documents if you know where to look for them. Uh, but once she goes through her stuff, then we can talk more big picture. Cause I know you guys have a ton of questions and I, I think it's important that we get to some of those questions. So. I'm going to kick it over to Stephanie to start the uh, presentation. Great. Thanks, Abby, and, and thank you. Um, like Abby said, I'm Stephanie Kamer. I work for Eagle and Water Resources Division and a new section that was set up basically when COVID happened a couple years ago. Um, it's called Emerging Pollutants Section. We mainly deal with PFAS, so we're, um, we actually have staff that are dedicated to working on PFAS issues in wastewater every day. So um, I want to I might be giving you too much information. I'm going to go to try to go fast because um, I don't want to overwhelm you, but there has been a lot of information that we've gained in the last several years. And so I wanted to make sure you had that um, and talking about what we know about biosolids, what we know about PFAS and municipal wastewater. So back in 2018, um, we did initiate a, a, a program. It was called the Industrial Pretreatment Program PFAS Initiative. This involved 95 municipal wastewater treatment plants in the state that were federally required to have industrial pretreatment programs. I won't get into the, the, the statutes that and what, why they were required, but basically these facilities have industrial facilities, industrial users to their municipal systems that discharge processed wastewater, and these municipal plants are required to regulate those discharges to make sure that they don't um, cause effluent, um, pass through of pollutants in the effluent from the facilities that they don't um, interfere with the processes at the wastewater treatment plant. We don't want them disrupting the municipal plants, and we also don't want them to interfere with the solids management, the you know, the, the management of solids that cre get created from municipal facilities. So 2018, we had 95 facilities that went through this process. Um, they were required to look at their industrial users that were most likely to use PFAS as part of their systems. So think of like chrome plating facilities. They were required to screen those most likely um, facilities for PFAS. They sampled them if they were above screening criteria, which was very conservative as 12 parts per tr trillion per PFOS. 
they were then required to sample their own effluent um, so that we could evaluate, you know, was their pass through occurring? If the pass, if their effluent was above criteria, um, they then had to work with those users to reduce, reduce control, eliminate PFAS coming into the system. So we implemented that back in 2018. It's actually been very successful. It's been a very good way for us to identify significant um, concentrations coming into the plants and get them um, getting them out of the plants before they get discharged and also before they can build up in residuals. Part of that we also required if they had effluent um, PFOS concentrations above 50 parts per trillion that they sampled their biosolids. That was the first time back in 2018 where we started getting an understanding of you know concentrations and biosolids and we were one of the only states in the nation to really even do it back then. So there was a lot of unknowns um, when we started that process. Um, now, today, um, our, our process for the IPP is actually getting rolled into our municipal permits as they get reissued. So if required, um, our permits going forward will have, you know, the same type of source reduction, elimination control, monitoring requirements actually in the in PDS permits going forward. And so next slide. So another Thing that we implemented back in 2018 and this was later you know we did the IPP initiative in the spring by fall um, we did the statewide study um, we looked at municipal plants again uh, we did sampling of influent effluent and biosolids or sludge from 42 different wastewater treatment plants in the state we did this because we wanted to have a better understanding of PFAS concentrations where is it coming from what is happening with the residuals we looked at the 20 largest municipal plants in the state. We also looked at 22 additional plants that had various flows. We wanted to have an understanding, you know, it's the size um, impact what we find. We looked at different treatment processes at the plant. So that was part of our study. Um, most of the plants we looked back in 2018 were our IPP facilities though, um, because we felt like that's where we likely had the most significant sources and wanted to have a better understanding. Um, there were a few that were non um, IPP facilities. Uh, next slide. So again, I'm running through this pretty fast. Um, there's a lot of background information available on our websites, but this slide is a graph. Um, this is actually the results, the biosolids or sludge results from that statewide study that we did back in 2018. These are the 42 facilities that we sampled and we've got them kind of listed in order of PFOS results and the residuals. So um, I did this this way so you could see, um, you know, the ones on the end are the higher concentrations of PFOS that were found in our industrial result. There are orders of magnitude above the majority of the facilities that we sampled. And these are actually the facilities that we determined had industrially impacted concentrations of PFOS in their biosolids. Um, I did it this way because sometimes we present this information on a log scale and you kind of lose, you get to see all the results, but you kind of lose the scale of how much higher concentrations were in the industrially impacted biosolids as opposed to what we saw in other municipal biosolids um, that we sampled as part of those 42. And um, these at the end, these are all IPP facilities, um, but we also had IPP facilities mixed throughout. So I just want to point that out. We use this information, um, you know, to help us then look at, you know, we had concerns back then. Again, we were one of the only states actually looking at PFAS and residuals at municipal plants. And so we wanted to have an understanding, okay, we know we have, we have these industrially impacted concentrations, and then we know we have some, you know, typical or average con concentration. What does that mean? Um, to land application sites that might have received biosolids. So if you go to the next slide, Kelly, I think. Um, so we put put we put together basically another study kind of teaming off of the statewide study to look at land application sites that received biosolids. And we sampled for the facilities that had the industrial impacted concentrations. We wanted to look at field application sites from four of those facilities. And then we also wanted to get an understanding of the other facilities. So we looked at five facilities from what we consider non-industrially impacted. Um, we went through a prioritization process to select fields from those facilities. We, we um, looked at a 
uh, several different measures, but basically we wanted to screen fields that had um, the highest amount of biosolids applied over a length of time over the entire area of the field. And so we considered those fields to be our highest priority because we consider those to probably be our, our, our likely our worst case scenario um, of what we would find from um, applications from that particular facility. Um, our field screening involves sampling soils. Uh, if there was drain tiles presence, we sampled the drain tiles. If there were swales or standing or perched water on the fields, we sampled that. We sampled adjacent surface waters if those were present. Um, and then at four locations, three of the industrially impacted and one of the non-industrially impacted, we also installed monitoring wells and sampled groundwater. So next slide. So this slide is basically the same slide I showed you two slides ago, um, but this is actually in log scale. So you can actually see the results um, of PFOS and the biosolids. These are the industrial impacted slides. You can't see my cursor, but basically on the far right, um, those in orange are the industrially impacted. So those are the four facilities that we sampled that were industrially impacted. And then we did a range of facilities throughout that 42. So we got kind of on the higher end of non-industrial, the low end, and a few in the middle. And again, we had, um, I think, a range. Most of them were IPP facilities. And uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about this slide? I feel like there's another point to make. Um, but um, basically, we do find low concentrations of PFOS in municipal biosolids, but again, industrially impacted, we're considering those really high elevated levels of 150 parts per billion or more. All right, next slide. So this is just in a nutshell, kind of our general findings of doing that field screening. We did look at 22 fields um, associated with those nine facilities. The fields that we looked at that were um, that received biosolids from non-industrially impacted biosolids or facilities, um, for the most part, we did find um, either non-detectable or low concentrations of PFAS in soils, uh, surface water, and groundwater at the site. Um, we did not have any, any exceedances of surface water quality values associated with those fields, and we did not have any exceedances of the Part 201 criteria for groundwater. We only put monitoring wells in one of the fields, but um, we didn't have an exceedance there. Uh, for the fields where we looked at where that did receive the industrially impacted, however, we did find higher concentrations in soils. We don't have soil criteria at this time to compare those two, but they were more elevated. Uh, we did have several um, instances where we had exceedances of water quality values um, and the surface waters associated with those fields, and we did have some exceedances of Part 201 criteria for PFOS and PFOA and shallow or perched groundwater on the fields. Um, the way we looked at groundwater is we installed nested monitoring wells. So we had a shallow well right next to a deeper well. Um, the shallow well, we did find uh, exceedances, whereas the deeper well, um, we did not have any exceedances. So the shallow well, we did find some, however, there did not appear to be impacts in the deeper groundwater associated with these sites. So um, I guess this kind of gives you a background of where we are and kind of what we focused on. We use this information to tell us, you know, we really need to look at industrially impacted fields. Um, we use, we share this information um, with MPART, with MDARD and MDHHS. We've been participating and helping um, run a land application work group where we um, discuss results, talk about you know any issues that might come up. Um, part of those discussions in our field work in Wixom and on the, the fields there is why there's been additional um, efforts on that area because we did feel it was unique. It did receive industrially impacted biosolids. Um, the crops were being used to feed cattle directly on the farm. There was a cycle happening that I'm sure um, Abby will talk about more. But we 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 did um, focus our efforts, and we continue to think that that's where our focus um, could be going further, or should be looking at historical um, sites. So if we go to the next slide, um, this effort, you know, I think you might have a question of like, okay, so we know what you looked at, you know, what are you doing today? 
to, to prevent industrially impacted biosolids from being land applied. And we do have a process in place to prevent that. Um, back in 2018, when we first did the study, those facilities that had those high levels, we immediately worked with them to suspend their land application program, have them start working with their sources to control them and eliminate them, and they were very successful. Almost most of those plants had a 99% reduction of PFAS coming into their plant within, you know, a few months of understanding that there was an issue after they worked with the source. Um, we've used kind of the information we've learned over the past several years to implement what we're calling a interim strategy for land application of biosolids containing PFAS. Uh, the reasons it's an interim strategy is because EPA is currently in the process of doing a risk assessment looking at PFAS and biosolids. And so we wanted something, a regulatory process to be in place as we wait for EPA to complete their risk assessment. So this process that we implemented back, um, we announced it in March of last year, it was implemented July 1st of 2021, establishes a regulatory process, it sets some guidelines. Its goal is to reduce um, exposure of PFAS and um, being applied in the environment and to make sure that we're no longer applying um, industrially impacted biosolids. So um, through Dr. this, yep. Before you go on, um, just to clarify, so normally the biosolids program is uh, run and overseen by EPA, correct? So they would normally set those standards for biosolids. So it's delegated to us under Part 24, but the risk assessment process is done through EPA. It's a federal program. The risk assessment is done through EPA. So yes, they are responsible to evaluate um, potential contaminants of concern and, and biosolids are um, required to go through a risk assessment process. They're in the, in the throes of doing that right now for PFAS. It's gonna take them time to complete that process. Um, Michigan's delegated the program to implement from EPA, um, but but we can't. We need them to get establish the criteria, if that makes sense. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Yep. yep. So part of this process, though, we are requiring um, biosolids to be sampled for PFAS prior to any land application. That again started on July 1st. Um, we've received 178 biosolids sample results since July 1st from 162 facilities in Michigan. Um, only one of those facilities um, had concentrations of PFOS in their biosolids at industrially impacted levels. And that facility actually um, is one of our 2018 original industrially impacted facilities. They had some, some issues at their site. They were re-exposed to PFAS from historical contamination. And so, um, unfortunately had a had a spike, but they were sampling. Um, they know what the issue is. They're going to work on it. Um, they actually hadn't land applied since 2018. So um, uh, we are, you know, this process, I think, is helping us to ensure that the facilities continue to look at source reduction, to identify additional sources coming into their plants, to work with those sources, to remove them if, if there's a source available to find. Um, we did require that um, as part of this process that they communicate to any landowners or farmers that are going to be receiving the biosolids um, what the PFAS concentrations were and, and the biosolids that they're receiving. And then I think I just have one more slide. Um, so I, I hit on this a little bit earlier, but um, we do, you know, we do have a concern. We do feel like we have a good interim step moving forward in Michigan to make sure we're not continuing to, you know, to cause an issue. Um, but we do um, have a concern about the legacy sites or the historical sites that may have received industrially impacted biosolids in the past. So we do have a land application um, subcommittee work group that was formed and it involves um, EGLE staff, uh, MDARD staff, and DHHS staff, as well as MPART staff to help kind of do a look back to try to identify municipalities that may have had impacted biosolids in the past that maybe we don't see it today when we sample their biosolids, but could have they been impacted in the past? Um, we want to look at that and we also want to look at, you know, there's other land application of other residuals that are, are done as beneficial reuse and these include 
things like put paper sludge waste. Um, so we want to look back to see, you know, could have any of those land application processes um, have created an issue? So we're in the process of doing that, working with that subcommittee, and that's that's ongoing. And so with that, I will turn it over to Abby. All right, thank you. Um, and I feel like we should, yeah, we can probably break for some questions now. I think there's, like Stephanie said, uh, there's a lot of questions that come from this. Um, this is, you know, we've taken a pretty comprehensive look at what's going on today, uh, but we still have questions on, you know, some of this stuff historically uh, that was done. And Stephanie, I think we've been able to find records back into the early 90s. I think we're still struggling to find the records past 90, right? So, so the current biosolids program that, that we have was established under Part 24. In 1997, I think it took effect in 1999. So we have very good records from 1997 on. Um, before that, you know, it wasn't as regulated. There, you know, there, it's a mix. Um, if we can find records for applications before that, so there is a there is a gap of what we know um, prior, namely prior to the mid 90s. All right, so let's go ahead and take some um, questions if you think, Sandy, that's all right. Yeah, Tony, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Sandy. Stephanie, thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting and informative. Um, one question, actually I actually have two questions, but the first, I just want to be clear that, that uh, farmers are allowed to spread biosolids and use them as fertilizers with concentrations at up to 150 parts per billion which if I'm doing my math correctly is 150,000 parts per trillion. That seems like a really high number. Um, how did you, how did not necessarily you, how did the agency come up with that number as a threshold? So it's not a risk-based number. Um, EPA is, is in the process of conducting the risk assessment. This is a number based on the review of the information that we have. So based on our review of all the data, um, we felt pretty comfortable saying, you know, 150 parts per billion above is clearly industrially impacted and no, no further land application should be done. We don't have soil criteria. We don't have EPA criteria to compare against. So um, we did we did make that decision. Um, a part of the, the interim strategy I didn't touch on is we do have tiers based on the results that the facility is a facility as they take PFAS. Um, analysis of their biosolids, depending on where they fall, they may have to do additional mitigation measures before land applying, depending on how what their levels are. So anything 50 parts per billion or up to 149 parts per billion, they have to actually reduce their land application rate um, for the site or some an alternative mitigation strategy for us to review and approve. So, um, you know, it's 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 moving forward. Um, it's it's not risk based, but this is 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 what we chose to help well, us kind of move forward and make sure we weren't we weren't continuing to apl apply levels that we felt were industrially impacted. And and Stephanie, so just to make it clear, the at anything over fifty parts per billion can't be applied at uh, the same rate that something a lower concentration. So it's basically applied at a half rate of what, um, so uh, uh, 1.5 tons per dry, or dry tons per acre, if I'm getting my um, memory is serving me. And so they basically are diluting it, but it's being knifed into the ground. So it doesn't represent a soil concentration. You can't look at these um, biosolids thresholds as soil concentrations. It doesn't quite, there's like a 300 times dilution factor in there once it's actually in, mixed in with the soil. Um, yeah, I think it's like 500 times dilution factor. But we, but we, but to Tony's point, we definitely don't want anything that's industrially impacted. We don't want uh, spread on the soils at all, but uh, because of the amount of source reduction that's actually been going on, the average concentration, I thought, Stephanie, what are you guys around uh, 10 to 15 parts per billion is, is about what everybody's running right now? I think, um, I think that the, the average is like 20 parts per billion, but that's skewed because of our last, the one industrially impacted facility that we just got in. Um, the median, so if you throw out 
that facility in the really low, the median's like 9.8 parts per billion. So that's most of the facilities are, are below 20, um, median's 9.8 or something like that parts per billion. And they would still have the 500 times dilution. So yeah. does that answer your question, Tony? Well, yeah, it does. And I think what, I, what I've heard that there really hasn't been a health risk assessment done. Uh, obviously, you don't have the guidance for that. Um, the, the even 9.8 or 10 or 15 or 20 is a, sounds like a pretty high number. Again, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I don't know, but it sounds like a pretty high number when you consider it's 20,000 parts per trillion that we're talking about. But I guess my, my follow up and then I'll, there are there others who want to answer? And, and Stephanie, you may not know this. What has been done or what is being done to, uh, to, to correlate or, or basically to test the crops on these farms uh, and the cattle and uh, the meat, not just the meat, but also the milk uh, to determine what, you know, you got something going in and what's coming out and what's, what's showing up on our shelves. That's really the, kind of the bottom line question. So I'll take that for Stephanie. The uh, some of the a lot of the work is pretty preliminary right now, Tony. We've got some um, some crop uptake uh, studies going on across the country. We've got some uh, basic research that was done in New Mexico from that dairy herd. We're talking extensively with our friends in Maine who have again have dairy herds that were impacted by biosolids. Um, but the the research we're just starting to put piece together the research to really make that connection. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of variability between crops, depending on what crop is grown in what field, you're gonna get a wide variety of, um, of results. And so I don't know that we can, we can really, uh, right now at least with the science that we have, predict uh, that crop uptake and then what the resulting impacts are going to be to cattle and or to food. Um, this now on the, uh, we have had conversations with USDA. They've indicated to us that they have been doing, um, you know, they've got their um, food basket study that they're doing and they've been doing, they've included PFAS. Uh, we have been told at least that they've done uh, like 2,500 um, beef samples across the country. For the most part, all of it's non-detect, but remember their detection limits about a, a 0.5 parts per billion for beef. Um, and so I think that's something that definitely needs to be explored. They are finding it in a few, but uh, pretty low levels amount. Um, so I don't think this is a widespread issue, but again, you know, um, that's something that we're really uh, hoping that USDA and FDA will continue their investigations and research into. And I know they've got a lot of things going on, but um, as far as where they are all in the processes, it's still a little unknown. Can I, can I just add one thing just to add on, not about um, a question on the crop, but as far as you know, the other fields, we did actually look at fields that would have received anywhere from 55 parts per billion PFAS to down to three parts per billion. So that was part of the field screening that we did do. And, and again, those were the non-industrial facilities. We did not find, um, you know, we did find some detections, but not elevated like we did at the industrially impacted. So um, we looked at surface water, um, soils at those sites. And then we also looked at one of the sites at groundwater. So there is, there is information, it's, it is posted online in several locations, if you're interested in looking at that. Yeah. Okay, moving us along here. Lynn, you got your hand up? Thank you, thank, thank you Sandy. Um, I'll be brief. One of my questions, um, Tony already brought up about the 150 parts per billion. Um, so we don't need to go back to that. Um, however, it when I looked at this, it talked about this was an interim limit that you set. What, what do you mean by interim? Like five years? Meaning it's, it's subject to change as new information becomes available. So as EPA makes progress and developing, um, conducting the risk assessment and works towards, you know, establishing criteria, if that's, if that's what the risk assessment finds, or as we, as we become aware of information, um, we, we could update our strategy. Um, we're doing that currently based on 
information we learned over the last year, we're updating some of the monitoring. You know, this is kind of in the weeds, but some of the monitoring requirements for a few of our facilities based on what we learned over the last six months. So um, we didn't want to set a date on it. We wanted it to be interim so that we had flexibility to adapt to the science as it evolves. Yeah, no, that, that I, I see that. That makes sense. And I, first of all, again, just to deal with the situation, even without the USDA backing up with particular EPA standards, it's great that, that we're on this type of situation. But um, I guess I'm going to send this over to Dave Wynn's committee about turn off the tap. It makes no sense at all to me to put any <laughs> any amount of uh, biosolids um, on our fields. And, our, and we're just opening up a Pandora's box. I mean, to what degree are you going to sample every crop? And my goodness, I can't imagine keeping up with these large amounts of biosolids. And I don't know. It's it's something I would I would look forward to being one of the states that moved past this idea and think of other alternatives. It uh, mm -hmm. doesn't sound good to me anyway. But there's a lot of hands up, and I know we have other things to talk about. I will leave it at that. But thank you very much. Thanks, thank you, Lynn. Lynn. All right, Scott, Harvey. Yeah, just a quick question about the biosolids or the sludge that has been detected uh, that can't be used for biosolids in fields. Where is that going to now? So it's it's a difficult situation for those facilities. Some of those facilities are still storing that industrially impacted biosolids at their site because they have had struggled to dispose of it. Most landfills don't want biosolids, not just because of PFAS, but then you have industrially impacted biosolids and you, most landfills really don't want it. Um, so then, you know, they're really restricted on what they can do. It's not something that these, these are public utilities. It's not something they budgeted for to suddenly have this expensive cost. So many of them still have storage issues. They're looking to try to identify ways to 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 remove those, but most likely they're going to go to um, a landfill is is the likely source once they they find out a way to do that. But many of them are still dealing with this issue. This is this is a, has been a problem for these utilities. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Did that answer you? Was that OK? Um, that answered it. It wasn't OK, but it answered it. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I just want to make sure you got the answer, not the answer. You got a response. How's that? There's a difference there. All right. Um, Connie, I think your hand is up next. OK, I have a couple of questions. The first is, I find the data kind of um, I, very unsettling. And by that I mean, here you have wastewater treatment plants serving industrial Detroit, serving industrial Flint, serving industrial Grand Rapids, and they have, like have nothing. And then you look at Gaylord, and Gaylord is way up there. To me, that is illogical. It's as if there is something the matter with your sampling protocol. There's, it, it's just weird. And I, to me, I don't trust your data, to be very frank with you, because it's it's counterintuitive. Right. Um, it, it uh, Maybe Connie, we need to sit down and have an in-depth meeting and actually go through the data with you. Um, we did have some of the top scientists in the country working on this data with uh, with DEQ at the time with Eagle, um, and so I, I think we're pretty confident in the data and the results. But um, certainly welcome to set up a separate meeting and go through that that data individually, so it's understandable because it is a lot of data. And it's not always intuitive. I on, personally had Stephanie sit with me for many meetings explaining to me what all of it meant. So I'm there with you. Well, when you have the most industrial contaminated uh, places in the country, like Detroit and Flint and Grand Rapids, 
and you say, hey, they don't have any PFAS. And here's Gaylord, which has what? Uh, pulp and uh, they, they don't even have that. They have more like sawmills and tourist industry. And they're way up there. That has to be explained because that is just, not, that doesn't seem right. Yeah. The, the, the second the second thing is, uh, Stephanie, you say that the biosolids, okay, you're going to take the 150 part per billion, but are you really checking how much groundwater is being contaminated with that 150 part per billion application time after time after time? You haven't put in nested monitoring wells in every one of these places. So maybe your 150 part per billion is not a good number to use. Maybe you should be more like 20 part per billion or something very low. Uh, and then the third thing is on your industrial pretreatment permits, you said you started to have restrictions on PFAS concentration starting in October, 2021. Okay, what happens how long are those permits before they're up for review again? Can some facility uh, continue to dispose of PFAS until their permit runs out in say 2026, five years from now? Do you no. know the answer? Yeah, no. I mean, we've been implementing the IPP initiative since 2018. Um, we had a municipal permitting strategy that yes. said in 2021, we would start rolling in basically the components of the IPP initiative um, into our permits moving forward. So they've been working, our municipal plants have been working on IPP and PFAS and municipal wastewater since 2018. We're one of the only states in the nation doing this. We have surface water followed quality criteria that allowed us to implement this program back in 2018. Most states don't have that. So, you know, they are, we are working, we are trying to find PFAS, address it at the source, get it out of the municipal plants. The municipal plants aren't generating the PFAS. They're just a receiver of it. And so we're, we are, we are working hand in hand with our municipal plants to try to, you know, limit concentrations coming into the plants and then ending up in effluents and residuals. So, there's a lot of effort going on. Um, and then I know you had a couple other points and I, I don't know. I don't know if you not wanted me to respond to those or not, no, but you know, I, I hear do. what you're saying. Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie, we have a bunch of people lined up with questions. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's okay. Let, let me just say last thing to Stephanie. I would suggest, and I could help you with this if you want, uh, but Monroe would be a place you really want to look and I can show you where to look because they had, I did work for Jefferson Smurfit, which was a big paper mill and also for the River Raisin uh, paper company way back when. Okay. So all right, all right. it's important to look at. Boots right, on the ground, it. right there to help you. Okay, if you could make sure you take your raised hand down after you've asked your question. Oh yeah. Forget. No, same with you, Scott. All right, uh, Dave, I think you're next. And you're muted. No. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> um, can the, the last graph that you had on your presentation, I had one quick question. Can we pull up that graph real quick? Yeah, that's it. All right. Can you explain the, the what the columns are and what the numbers when you see that I see the numbers in yellow. OK, um, what are the numbers? Or what are the columns in gray? What are, what are those for? Those are so these are all the facilities that were included in that 42 wastewater yep. treatment plant study that we did. So the columns in orange or yellow are are the wastewater treatment plants that we selected to do the field screening of. We, we couldn't screen all the fields, um, obviously, so we had to select a subset of, of the 42. We selected all the industrially impacted um, biosolids facilities that were land, land applying, and then we selected a subset of the non-industrially impacted. And the orange just identifies 
you know, which ones we selected. And hopefully you can see that we tried to get in a range of the non industrially impacted when we did the field screening because we did want to have an understanding of, you know, what what levels of PFAS we were going to find at these sites. So the gray is is the areas, the sites that you did not test. Right. Yeah. OK. And the column is the you got one part per billion, 20 parts, 100. Is that what those will represent? Those are the PFOS concentrations in the biosolids. OK, when we sampled them in 2018. Do you plan on do you plan on hitting any of these other sites in the near future? No, we have we have plants. Um, we have, you know, like this year we had 162 plants that sampled biosolids for PFAS. So um, we know that there's land application of biosolids occurring beyond these 42. We can't sample all the fields. So this we did look at all the industrially impacted um, and then we did a subset of the non industrially impacted. Well, just, I'm just going to make one quick comment and then I'll move on. Um, from from one particular that I have is I go to Township wastewater treatment plant in Wordsmith. A lot of a lot of data has been collected at that facility. You may want to get a hold of Beth Place and and she can maybe provide you a lot of information. Yeah, yeah, we we do talk to Beth. We've met with her several times, but I will. Um, okay. We will continue to work with her, and I, I will reach back to her specifically. Thank you. Solids. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, Teresa, you got your hand up. Thank you. Um, Connie kind of uh, expressed what I wanted to say, but I just want to say I find this really alarming. And uh, just being a layperson, um, uh, it really is shocking me. Um, but what I wanted to ask, we, uh, we here in Detroit, we know that when our industrial wastewater uh, comes out, there's more chemicals than PFAS. And we know that um, things adhere to PFAS. Uh, are you guys looking at the cumulative impact of other chemical chemicals along with the PFAS that is going into these, you know, coming from these biosolids? And um, I want a clarification. You said um, the EPA is doing a risk assessment. Is that for human impact or for animal impact as far as the cows and, so, and impacts in the, into the milk and into the eggs and stuff like that? Yeah, so so we are we are not looking at other chemicals. This is PFAS. This is PFAS orientated that I'm providing with you. EPA actually um, has part of their risk assessment is they looked they do look at other contaminants of concern. I don't I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I don't have the list of other contaminants that they're looking at. PFAS is one of the ones that they are moving forward and working on right now. Um, their risk assessment it, it looks at several pathways. And I want to say there's like seven to eleven different pathways. So they're looking at groundwater, they're looking at surface water, they're looking at soils, direct contact, they're looking at crop uptake, they're looking at, you know, public health, so they have multiple pathways um, that they are are looking at as part of that assessment. And that's part of the reason why it's it's going to take them a little bit of time to complete it. OK, and one last question. And um, am I to, to understand that um, Eagle has the ability to set standards like parts per billion, parts per trillion uh, on their own and not with under the guidance of the EPA? In some in some cases for for biosolids, um, that's why Stephanie talked about interim standards. Is is this isn't um, these are screening levels or thresholds. It's not an actual um, set standard under law, and so that's why we're getting all of the wastewater treatment plants to participate th in this and drive down those sources. Um, Obviously, for drinking water, we have set standards uh, through the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, and we do have standards for groundwater cleanup. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I'm glad you're here. Um, all right, Daniel. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. That was a lot of good information and a lot of work behind it. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing that with us. I don't want to lose. Um, you know, how, how much effort you, you put into that. Um, it clearly generated a lot of interest uh, from us with, you know, a thousand questions and, you know, we could keep going on all night. But the, you know, I, I, 
I, I'm fighting down my sort of scientific urges to sort of pull in all these sort of scientific questions. And yeah, I'm trying to think about how this would impact, you know, me and my neighbors if we live next to an impacted farm or or even a farm that's been applying a low level of of uh, PFAS biosolids over many years. So yeah, do, just if I'm doing the math correctly, if it's an average of 20,000 parts per trillion and there's a dilution factor of 500, that's still 40 parts per trillion. You know, you're applying that over a long period of time. Um, and, and we know PFAS don't break down. Um, so what does that do to to build up in the soils? Um, you know, it, it raises a lot of question about those long term cumulative impacts for me. And I think that's that's where my concern is. It's you know, there are clearly these problem spots and the, these problem wastewater treatment plants. But it, it comes back to this question of. Yeah, you know, it, it makes me uncomfortable and I can see where it would make a lot of people uncomfortable to know that, you know, in, in industrial waste in, in biosolids is, is being applied to farm fields. I, you know, I think a lot of people really like the idea of sustainable application of, of biosolids. It's a good thing to do with waste, then what else could you do with it? But this idea that there's, you know, known industrial impacts from PFAS or other things in these biosolids, and then that those are still allowed to be applied. You know, I, I think that makes a lot of folks uncomfortable. So, you know, there's, there's just just throwing that out there for sort of all of us to consider in terms of how how do we go forward in terms of communication and and thinking about addressing this issue big picture because you know, it, these things aren't going away and um, you know once we apply them to the fields they're they're going to be out there for a long time I'll stop there. So, Dan, I, I I don't know if it was a direct question but just to you know I understand what you're saying um, I. You know, I, I, I do think it would be good for you to take a look at, you know, the non-industrial fields that we did apply to, um, and and kind of review that information because we did target this, you know, fields that they used most heavily. Um, most fields aren't going to be used every year, and most fields aren't used every, you know, maybe they get five applications over their their lifetime, um, but it varies depending on the farmer and you know how how much he wants the biosolids. So. It's 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 going to be very. We didn't find significant impacts to surface water associated with the non-industrial. We found you know low detections or no detections in soils. So we did not find the elevated levels that we found in the industrially impacted fields. So that's why we've kind of focused our efforts, shift our efforts in lieu of having EPA criteria. You know, as the science evolves, you know things will, may change and we may have better criteria to set. Um, but we, you know, right now, other than picking a number, you know, we feel comfortable with where we're at, but, you know, it could change as, as time goes on. So, um, and then I just wanted to say one thing, as far as industrial and our biosolids, PFAS is not just from industrial sources, it's from normal residential and commercial wastewater, we, not at high levels, but at, at low levels, you will get PFAS, PFOS, um, coming in to influence in municipal plants just from, you know, residential areas because it's in us, it's in the products we use, um, it's going to come through to our treatment plants and it's going to, we're going to find it in the residuals. So it's not just industrial sources, but that that concern is why we started with the IPP facilities because we wanted to tackle those and have our facilities start looking at those first. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop because I know we need to move on. All right. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, Joe, you've been so patient. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm a member of the the membership committee. I was very happy to uh, work with uh, Mary and Dan. I'm also uh, a licensed professional engineer over 40 years in Michigan. So what I like to say is, uh, members here, take a little break. State of Michigan, Stephanie and Abby and so forth and the department has been leading the country in doing all these 
work. And the municipal plans, you know, receive what people you know, flush down to the pipe. So yes, there are industrial uh, sources, some are getting uh, real uh, attention these days, but majority of them are treating what you and I flush down the pipe. So uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to commend what the state of Michigan has been doing on this topic. And I just want to say, keep up the good work. All right, thank you, Joe. Um, so I, here's what I heard kind of summarizing. I think everybody agrees we really want to turn off the tap. As a taxpayer, I'm tired of paying to pick this up. Um, so I think we all agree we need to figure out is really putting industrial waste biosolids on our land a way to turn off the tap or not? doesn't seem like logically it is. I heard people say that they want to see more food testing done to make sure it's not in eggs, in beef, in crops, in whatever it is that we're eating. I heard people say that we need to test more in areas because there's suspicion. I also wondered about the Kalamazoo area. There's a lot of crops and I grew up with those paper mills, so I know there's a lot down there. The cumulative impact of not just PFAS at those high rates, but also the other chemicals that could be mixed in with that and the effects that it has on our health. So I think those are the areas that I heard people say pretty strongly that we need some more work to do. I mean, it's great to say, look at, we're doing better than anybody else, but mm -hmm. you know, it's like, we can't just keep laying on that, that trophy anymore. We gotta just do better. I think the last thing I would say is, if we're waiting for the EPA to set standards, good grief, we're all gonna be in a nursing home together talking about when will the EPA set standards. So I think we just need to figure out a way to lead that and not use that as an excuse. So uh, that's what I'm gonna say, cause I didn't raise my hand. All right, um, <laughs> I would suggest that we move on to the next subject, which will probably be just as exciting. Uh, unless somebody really feels a compelling need to bring up something more on the biosolids issue. Can we all agree we'll move on to public notification in that response? So I will I just don't know where Sandy, if yeah. we if we want to come back to um maybe a a work group or some sort of a more in-depth study on biosolids, we can do that in a separate session or do a special session to to kind of dive into some of that stuff. Cause we did, I mean, Stephanie, you know, basically did five slides on three years worth of research. And so it's complicated. And, and so I'm just offering that up if you guys are interested. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to the public notification. I know the engaging the public group set out um, their recommendations on this, and then um, Abby, uh, you sent back your recommendations. So I don't know how we structure this conversation. If people want to um, comment on what they read about it, if people want to discuss it, uh, I guess raise your hand and we can, can start. Yeah, we can, can Andy and I start? Because we did have a lot of, um, a lot of behind the scenes conversations that weren't necessarily captured in that memo that I'd like to to kind of start with, if you don't mind. Start away. You own the the team, so it's you. You go ahead. <laughs> I don't own anything. We're we're all here together. Um, but I know that we had many conversations um at the at the Empart level and at the Eagle level, and so you, you want to start out the conversation with um, some of your thoughts and some of those discussion points? Sure, um, I'll be quick because um, conversation is is kind of the point. Um, first of all, um, thanks again to the to the group and the COG as a whole for the effort you put into that and um, and in your patience as a as a group as a 
as Abby mentioned, as we uh, discussed your recommendations and wrestled with them in, in Empire and, and Eagle over the last couple of months. Um, you know, I really feel like your recommendations are a reflection of what makes this group so important. They show your deep knowledge and varied knowledge and strong leadership that you bring to Michigan's PFAS response. I was just um, reflecting on that as I was listening to the last conversation that we're really lucky to have a group of really engaged people with the with the kind of knowledge you have and the and the curiosity and passion. Um, and that showed up in the in the recommendations. Um, as we look, as I think I look at the recommendations, I don't want to speak for Abby. Yeah, you know, I think they provide sort of a North Star for our work, um, which is going to evolve over time on public notification. Um, there's something for us to keep working and learning and proving towards. Um, I think as we discuss them in Eagle, they also provided a opportunity for inspiration in terms of how much your efforts over time already in your short history have improved and parts approach to engaging the public. So, you know, that was certainly part of our conversation. And uh, personally, I think that the core principles that you laid out are particularly well said. I think um, we'll achieve a lot of solid outcomes to the extent we can use our collective energy to bring those principles to life. Um, in terms of the memo and response, um, you know, that it, it's intended to start or continue a conversation rather than than to end it. I think at its heart is an acknowledgement that we don't have all the answers, but we want to ask the hard questions and have the dis tough discussions with all of you. Um, and that's sort of what I'm most interested in tonight is, you know, sort of the, the, the important question I see, which is how can MPART leaders and COG members have open and curious and constructive conversations of uh, um, where everybody's perspective and expertise is respected and we can reflect and learn on our experiences so that we can continue to move closer to um, ever closer over time to to the to the sort of north star like i said before that that your memo memo laid out so that's where my head's going and is you know how do we have those conversations how do we structure them how do we organize them how do we move them forward um, I'm looking forward to supporting that in any way I can. And again, I just want to say thanks on behalf of Eagle um, for the hard work you, um, you're doing on all the book of work that the COG is involved in, but um, particularly in, in putting those recommendations in, in front of us and keeping the conversation going. So um, that's all I have to add tonight. All right, thanks, Andy. Um, and I'll just add a few words before we get to uh, getting into the the nitty gritty questions and answers. Um, like Andy said, we contemplated uh, a lot of different responses. Contemplated how do we best, um, you know, achieve what was in uh, the essence of the of the goals of your a public notification recommendation, which is, you know, make sure the public knows about this stuff. Um, and I, you know, I didn't go through in this particular memo and list all the ways that you guys have already influenced us and already had direct in, uh, effects to the way that um, we do notice. I think this situation with the Livingston Far County Farmer is a is a direct rec uh, reflection on your inputs. Um, we didn't have standards. We didn't have USDA standards. We didn't have state or federal. Um, but we knew that in the heart, you know, it was basically of what would the COG tell us to do in this situation? And you absolutely would have been right there uh, saying, nope, everybody needs to know whether or not it's a, a, a known health impact or whether or not we have standards, everybody needs to know. And so there are direct uh, results of this public notification process that are not easily captured in processes. They're not easily captured in protocols. And so, um, like Jerry said, this this public this response to the public notification recommendation is a yes 
and in my mind it's yes we agree with your goals and objectives help us get to the next step um it's pretty hard to put down a a b c and d will always happen because every single site we come across is individual and every single situation um, has to be custom uh custom done and and as you as you guys all know we are basically um cutting edge on on topics and uh, new horizons for PFAS work and how we do this stuff. It's not written into our statutes. It's not written into our legislation. And so we're working outside of those normal bounds. And so doing that, I think it's really important that we come back to the table and talk about, OK, in these specific situations, um, what's the best way to to go forward? And so I think um, hopefully that was I, I don't know if it was conveyed well in the letter or not um but that was really what we were trying to get across and so i will leave it there and let's go to questions because i want to make sure you guys get enough time and i know we've already got hands all right thank you uh lynn take it away okay well um i do appreciate the work um and um I think we've we've really made something um, uh, more complex than this document was ever meant to be. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The public needs to know. It, it's part of the very first part of the document we sent to you. It, it from M part it says, "quote When this was first formed, that." MPART shall direct the implementation of the state's action strategies, um, which includes, but it's not limited to, research, identify and establish these response actions relative to the discovery, find the places, communication, tell the people, and mitigation of PFAS, clean it up. And then right after that, it says to perform state and local public outreach in order to ensure, and that's a strong word, that residents in the impacted areas first listed, including all members of the community, local government, corporate and nonprofit partners, and impacted stakeholders are informed, that means told, notified. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit, <clears throat> calm down. Educated is explained to them and empowered. I have no idea what that word means. I wish it had never entered the dialogue of this day and age. Empowered to me would be that I was listened to and that I was told as, as soon as possible. So I worked alongside, I came in to help this group and we gave a very clear message. The public needs to know and it matches what MPART's stated goal is. So there's really no like case sensitive thing here. You need to tell people simply, and, and it was urgent a year ago. What happened in Traverse City after what's happened in, uh, in Rockford and Wolverine and delays, we, we were fired up and we wanted to take action because it's not right not to represent these people. It has nothing to do with making agency look good or bad it has nothing to do with making any of us look good or bad our purpose is to protect every person whether there are 10 wells or whether there are 10,000 every single person is important and i don't think we can forget that and that is why it was urgent a year ago it is more urgent now i frankly i appreciate the sentiments and the thank yous but really I want to see a concrete action and I can't stand by and wait and talk about this again for another year or two or three. I think we need to we need to get on it. And I, I'd like to, to close with this one simple example. I know it's kind of um, <laughs> folksy maybe, but I think it gets to the truth. When I was in Colorado in May, I decided to go hiking by myself one day. Everyone else was doing something. And I came to a trailhead. And at the trailhead, it warned about mountain lions in the area. And I'm like, hmm, okay, mountain lions in the area. 
last uh, a month before, a bear had killed a woman not too far from there. So I kind of took it seriously. Doesn't happen very often. And I decided, nah, I don't think I'm going to take that trail. I'm by myself. Da -da -da -da. That sort of thing. Now, I'm a visitor to the area. It warned me. How many times has a mountain lion attacked a person? Probably not very many. But do you have to have 10 people killed before you put a warning sign up? I don't think so. And then the other part of that is people in that area, the bed and breakfast we stayed at, it's like you stay in the bed with breakfast. Okay, so when you go out, here's pepper spray for the bears. Here's this you can use. Here's this you should do. And they educate you. So not said that you're afraid of going out and hiking, but you know what to do. And that's what Michigan needs to do. And I don't think it could be any more simple than that. So I, I would like to go on the record as, as grateful that, you know, that yes, we're, we are working together, but I'm not grateful for the pace. And I'm not grateful for, the, I'm not pleased with the outcome. We had hoped that more action would be taken. And at the very least, we think, I think, that at the moment an investigation begins, that list of people I included in the beginning are all notified. Last example, Millennial Park in Grand Rapids, city of Grand Rapids is our newest PFAS site. How soon will this park, which was built to um, provide recreation, particularly for inner city children, how long will it take before they study that water where everybody swims and recreates and fish? Because summer's coming up. There's an example. This needs to get out. Now, the more people who know about it, the more people can help to make a difference. And at least they can make the decision whether to take their children there or not. So I'm going to stop and um, let other people speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Um, all right, Mary. Hello, I will echo most of what Lynn said. Um, we discussed tonight in the public notification um, subcommittee. Uh, Scott confirmed that one of the key points was the fact that as soon as the investigation begins, we talked about that in a meeting and a half, that it should be the public is notified at that point. And I also would like to ask in the document that Abby sent out, in the paragraph right above letter A, the first sentence, it says the COG has already spurred improvements. So I would like to have that continue to build. And we'd like to know how to help. But we want our work to be considered in the serious intent that it was intended. And not to be written off as a memo. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, Tony. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I uh, appreciate the fact that the memo was shared, um, even though I find it deeply disappointing and I strongly disagree with its recommendation. Um, as I read the memo, if I had read the MPART memo without having read the COG memo, I would have not known what the COG memo really said because the MPART memo failed to accept and address the fact that the overarching principle that the COG has recommended is public notification at the time that the investigation begins. That isn't even addressed in the MPART memo until the tail end. There are, there are mischaracterizations in the beginning of the memo about what, in the MPART memo, about the, what the COG was recommending. And I would just like to say that as a, as a citizen who has been on the receiving end of, of invalidating communications like this for a long period of time, that I hope that MPART will learn 
begin to learn that the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge what people are saying, even if you don't agree with it. At least acknowledge the fact that this was the overarching recommendation of this group. That hasn't been done here. And when, and when you begin a communication that way, you, you turn people off almost instantly. And it's a source of a whole lot of problems that have been caused by Eagle and Empart, I think unknowingly and unintentionally, but it happens over and over and over. With regard to the recommendations, we didn't say wait a year and then tell us you're gonna wait longer to get around to thinking about how you might do it. What we said was we need to act and act swiftly. Now, the fact that there may be some difficult cases, understood, but what about the simple case? What about the Traverse City scenario? What is MPART's position? From reading this memo, I have no idea. And from the communications that we've received from MPART over the last several months, still have no idea. I hear, well, yeah, we like what you say, but we don't see the action. We don't see the, the, the urgency that the folks in Traverse City were trying to convey to us when they came to us last year and said, don't do this, tell us right away. I mean, MPART has missed the fact that this delay is just another in a series of unacceptable delays. So again, I say this respectfully, I say this with the, with the intent of trying to build a dialogue with MPART, but it's, it's gotta be a two-way street and right now it still doesn't feel that way. And so I guess I would leave with one question. And the question is this, if, the Traverse City scenario were presented to Empart and Eagle today. Would Empart and Eagle notify those 20 homeowners that, that were identified in the letter to the polluter at the same time? That's my question. You want the answer now, Tony? Yeah. We would implement our precautionary drinking water sampling immediately. So and you would notify them. If that's thank you. We well, we would notify well, as we're being sampled as we sample them. I guess okay, I well, it's you, one in the you, same. Sorry. It's it's one in the same. If you're if if you realize you have something like that, you get out and sample them as soon as possible, and you work. If we've got a libel party, then we let the libel party know as well. But you get out and sample them ASAP. So this that's the major change that has been implemented and has not been waited for us to write this memo. We have implemented that on nine or 10 different airports that we have known about in the state where the state has spent resources to go out and sample drinking water wells around those airports um, before we have any investigation data. And so, yes, that's exactly what we would do. That's what we've been doing and that's written up in our protocol now. Um, now, that's in cases where we know AFFF has already been used and we have good information that um, there's probably a source there, but we don't have the data. We don't know groundwater flow directions. So we basically draw a big circle and go out and sample those wells as soon as we can. So uh, my apologies for the interruption. If the Traverse, and on the date that that Traverse City letter was sent to Cherry Capital Airport, February, whatever it was, 2020, are you saying that on that same date you would have sent letters you would now send letters to the potentially impacted homeowners saying we've begun an investigation and we want to test your well. Is that is that what you're saying you're, you would do? I'm not sure if it would be. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the letters basically are written like that for access. We, we would like access to come and sample your well. There's an investigation going on over at such and such place. Um, if we've got the cooperation of the libel party, then we'll do that in tandem with them. If we don't have a libel party, then the state goes out and does it. But will people be notified of the risk? We don't know if there's a risk. We're going out as precautionary sampling. So I'm not sure that what else we can say other than we would like to sample your well because of potential contamination. There you go. You would say because of potential contamination. Yeah, I mean, we're, okay. Yeah. That's we're, a start. We're this invest, we're, we have a potential investigation. And so, and, and anybody of the other Eagle staff that are on the phone, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, they've done a number of these across the state over the last uh, year. And so, absolutely. And I think that's a big, you know, if, if it's not written in this and it didn't get communicated well, my apologies, but that is a huge change for us. We, you know, in the past, 
we would have waited until we at least had some knowledge of an actual concentration of uh, some data. And, and, and now we are not waiting, um, especially in those cases where we know a triple F has been used and heavily used at a lot of these airports. Does that answer it for you, Tony? Yeah, it does. Um, All right. It, it does. I, I, I've you. said enough. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rick. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I guess, echo some of the same comments. And uh, I think the uh, memo from the uh, uh, COG was really specific about uh, providing notification to the public uh, once there was an investigation. And you know, I read all the time in the newspaper about uh, boil water advisories, where if there's a change in pressure in the system, um, you know, people are given a notice to, to boil the water in a uh, in a municipal system. Or uh, even another example would be uh, like uh, in townships, if you're uh, going to change the zoning or something in a particular area. Um, there's a requirement to notify everybody uh, within a certain distance from from the site. And I think we're we're, we're just looking for uh, that sense of urgency where when uh, sampling does identify PFAS uh, in the groundwater in a certain area, and you uh, put out a notice to the industry that uh, is responsible, or you. Um, you know, put out a notice to the health department or something about that, that uh, the public, and we, we didn't you know, provide a lot of details uh, in our memo, but, uh, you know, there should be a certain area around that uh, uh, site where we've found contamination for the first time, and the public should be notified uh, that uh, there is potential that the uh, groundwater aquifer that they've been using uh, is contaminated. Uh, you know, when we when we put the boil water advisories out, you know, we don't, you know, just work with a particular fire hydrant or whatever that or break that caused the the pressure reduction. I mean, they go out to a certain area uh, all around that uh, area where the pressure uh, decrease uh, occurred, and they they notify everybody. So um, we're we're just looking for uh, a commitment to notify the public when uh, there's PFAS contamination detected in the groundwater. Uh, they've been relying on those aquifers for drinking, and they should be aware that uh, there may be a problem in that aquifer, and the, the, the people may decide to test their own water. Uh, they may not want to wait until, uh, you know, they uh, they decide to go out and, uh, you know, sample the, the residents. So they may want to put in a uh, treatment system on their own. Uh, we've had some contacts in our group with uh, some of the uh, residents around the uh, Cadillac uh, Tech Center and you know those the, the wells there that, that service the Tech Center uh, are right at the edge. Sometimes they're above and sometimes they're below. And some of the residents that live in between the Tech Center and the highway just heard about that and decided to check their own water and you know, one of them at least uh, reported back to our uh, member of our committee that uh, their well exceeded uh, the drinking well sta water standard. So I, I think it's important to get that information out there. And, uh, you know, we didn't have a specific, you know, radius around to, to, to talk about. I mean, we don't we don't have a, a prescriptive distance because I, I know that can vary based on, you know, what we know about the geology of the area and the concentrations. But I think there should be a commitment to uh, tell people that uh, once there's PFAS detected and there's groundwater wells, that uh, there could be an issue with your well and, uh, you know, provide them information about where to get the water tested and provide them information about uh, what, what you know about the site. So um, I, I certainly appreciate all the changes that have uh, occurred and uh, um, all the effort that uh, MPART is doing. And I think you know, we've all sat down on the committee and, uh, you know, we're, I think we're really uh, specific about the uh, the desire and it's it's aspirational, but I think we need to put pen to paper and, and make sure that uh, we, we figure out a way to notify the public, whether it's through the, the townships and the health department, 
you know, they're the ones that notify people when you have the boil water advisories and you have uh, um, planning and zoning changes. Uh, there's a regular procedure to go out and notify people. And I just think we need to have something uh, in place to notify people when their aquifer is uh, there. There could be a potential issue with the aquifer they're, they're drinking out, they're drinking their water from. So um, I guess that's all for me. So Rick, just so you know, um, every time we get uh, an MPART site that's coming through the process, it's evaluated to see uh, who's on drinking waters. We sit down with local public health. We sit down with the project manager. We sit down with all the Eagle staff as well as as long as as well as the Department of Health and Human Services, our DHHS staff, and we do that. We go through and look. Okay. Who do we think might have um, a well, even if it's municipal water area? We always sit down and look at the whole area because there's so many houses in areas that should be hooked up to municipal water that aren't yep. um, and or that are using crack wells, stab wells, whatever that they're drinking out of just to avoid paying a municipal water bill. And so we look for those in a lot of cases, our project managers and uh, DHHS staff are going door to door to try to talk to people about what they're using for their wells. And so we do put a lot of boots on the ground in trying to make that effort right at the beginning, even before these become true MPART sites and go live. Okay. Uh, that work is getting done. Okay, that's real good. And well, I guess, you know, the, the COG is just looking for that commitment that, uh, you know, once you know something um, and, and you're telling the industry or telling or identifying the site that uh, people get notified uh, in the best way possible. So thanks. Okay. All right, thank you, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Okay, Lynn. Unless your hand's still up by mistake. No, but if someone else wants to go first, if there's someone else in waiting, I can wait. Is there someone else waiting? Uh, I had my hand up, which followed. Why don't, why don't you go stuff. first? Yeah, yeah, you go okay. first. Um, I, I guess I, I would like to say if I, I think what we were all hoping to see, at least what I was hoping to see, is when you start an investigation, even if you don't know for sure there's PFAS there, I would like it if people were notified. I would have liked that in my case. If I had known, um, I don't know, 20 years ago that there could have been PFAS across the street, my life probably would be quite different. And I would want that exact same thing for everybody else. So even if you don't know it's there, I think people then have the opportunity, like the story Lynn said about the sign of mountain lions. If I think that it's there, I then can take control of my life and not have to wait and worry about a responsible party and all of that nonsense. If that's what your intent is now, when you start investigation that you're gonna let people know, I just ask that you put that in this memo clearly so there's not a lot of debate about it. And I understand there's gonna be situations that are difficult and that aren't gonna be that clean cut, but maybe the cog could actually be of benefit to you then, because we may be able to help problem solve as people that are kind of living with this. So that's one thing. The other thing I guess I would ask is that groundwater and drinking water is huge, but I wouldn't want to ignore uh, people that play in rivers and, and kids that play in the foam and people that fish and all of that. So I don't think we should ignore, um, you know, bodies of water that may have been contaminated that are used for recreation as well. And Millennial Park is a perfect example. I haven't seen anything in the news about that but I did hear about it. Um, so hopefully the word gets out about that as well. So that was all I had. Oh, somebody lowered my hand. Okay, uh, Tyler, I'm gonna call on you now. Thanks, Sandy. Um, yeah, I can definitely appreciate, you know, M part. <laughs> you guys have such a, a heavy lift, right? You're trying to get the work out. You've got budget constraints. Um, I'm convinced that you know, what are we over our 200th PFAS site for years and years? Ignorance was unfortunately bliss. So um, with that being said, um, there's only so much MPARC can do from a public notification standpoint. There's got to be other people we can pull in, whether it's, you know, local municipalities, you know, yes, MPARC 
you guys are shouldering a lot of this. There's dollars, there's people, but um, you can't do it all. And I feel like as a cog, you know, it's our responsibility to um, share our feedback, uh, but there's some constraints here. So um, any thoughts or insights on when it comes to public notification um, entities outside of MPARC, you know, that can spread the word that might have additional resources. Um, it's going to take a lot of us as um, the number of sites continue to grow and grow. Thanks, Tyler. Um, OK, well, I guess Lynn and Tony get to arm wrestle over who's next or something. Lynn had her hand up. First. OK, yeah, OK, thank Lynn. you. Um, OK, yeah, so um, I appreciate what Tyler just sent, said. <laughs> um, and yet I have to go back to the mandate from Governor Snyder, which is that it, MPART is supposed to do this. And so if they don't have enough resources, which I completely understand, and I do, I think all of you do know that I, I actually, I really appreciate the work that you do. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying you're not doing enough. I'm saying, I think it's time to talk to the legislator and, and the governors and say, listen, we need more money because we need more staff. We can't do this, you know, um, it has to happen. This is what it says here in MPART. This is what we're directed to do. We can't do it. We don't have enough money, time, and staff. We're backlogged. And I, when I talk to anybody, I talked to the site manager about the Millennial Park the other day. And it's, when I'm done, I, I always, and I don't do it in a, like, just like, so I can say that I said thank you. I, I tell them that I, I know you're underappreciated. I know you have a big job. I, I, I get it. I wish our laws were tougher. I wish you had more money to work with. I wish you had more staff. So thank you for what you're doing. I believe that completely. So get more people. The task has gotten too big. 200 mm -hmm. sites and growing. If Michigan wants to be the leader, they need more money and resources to do it. And then my last comment, and believe me, I probably already said last on the other. <clears throat> I have to go back to my example about the mountain lions for a minute. Had that sign not been placed at the front at that trailhead and it had been placed 15 miles into the forest on a tree, a ponderosa pine, it would be worthless to me. I would have just gone hiking. The thing is, that's how the website is. To put things and say this is accomplished because it's on the website isn't getting it very far. Most people don't wake up in the morning and decide, I think I'll go to the MPART website and see if there's any problems in my area. It's, it's just not going to happen. It's a great resource, especially for scientists and professionals who can navigate it. But people need to see it at the trailhead. They need to know what's up. And they need to know it now. So I, I'd like to go back. I feel this is a very urgent topic, and I hope that we can expedite and come up with some really good ideas together. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Tony. I'll be brief because Sandy touched on what I wanted to talk about, and that's um, the surface water bodies. Um, I, I, I'm concerned about the this, oh, it's really hard with surface water bodies. And I, I get that. But as someone who owns a home on a lake, that the DEQ knew was contaminated in documentation that, that it did not put out to the public that we didn't find out about for years afterwards. I don't wanna hear that it's hard because it isn't that hard. And it's, I, just, I just don't think this memo and the approach that Eagle is taking, I don't think there's a commitment here to move and to understand the urgency that people like me and other people around the state feel. And so I think there's a long way to go, but we need to go there fast. And I just, I'm very, very concerned with this leading the nation and everything's great, but we really don't have enough money. So we can't do enough, but oh, geez, great. We're doing good things. Come on. If we need more money, then let's all get together and ask for more money and be honest about the problem. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, Scott. Yeah, being uh, the originator 
responsible for our memo <coughs> back in July. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, having sat in on a lot of those meetings, especially the airport meetings, uh, I saw an awful lot of effort being made to go out and notify ones and twos and tens and twenties of people uh, for there may be a problem, which is what I would assume uh, continues on any investigation. I guess my concern with a letter back or the uh, answer to our memo is it looks like there is a significant gap between what we're asking for in the playbook and what can be done. Uh, I don't see that significant as as significant because I lived through some of those experiences. Uh, and I would like to see the letter being more your letter to us being more. This is what we've done from your recommendations. Uh, and that would encourage us to give more recommendations and not see that as a maybe I have to answer this in this way. Uh, I realize having been in state government that there is resistance within work groups and uh, the status quo is the status quo. But I've been able to bring up some uh, significant uh, suggestions having sat through those meetings. Like what's going to happen at Millennial Park. Uh, it was built on a landfill. You've got landfills to the south. You've got landfills to the west. And, and then there's this imaginary Kanawha Road that cuts through there. And you've got two different people in charge because one's Ottawa County and one's Kent County. So and we bring those things up and I know they're heard. But the gap isn't that big if we work together. Uh, that's what I have to say. And, I, and again, I've seen an awful lot of good movement towards uh, preventing the Traverse Cities of the future and preventing where Tony lives on the lake. But over time, uh, a lot of us have been burned. So we are skeptical. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I know we're getting it's we have like one minute, but I feel like we've got to have some direction of what we're going to do for the next meeting. And it sounds like um, a lot of people are hoping that we can get a little more clarification on what the procedure is moving forward for notification. Is that something that you think you can do? I'd if like to. I mean, if you guys are amenable, I'd like to. Um, have a couple people that could sit down and help us um, work through, uh, you know, drafting some of those those examples, um, because I find it's it's going to be very hard for us to talk in absolutes, but it's much easier to say, okay, here's some examples of what we've done and what we would in, do in these types of situations, um, and I think that will get us because, like um, Ken said, I think the gap isn't as big as what we might be talking about. Um, and maybe we're talking, maybe I'm saying apples and you guys are thinking oranges and we just need to smooth out our language. Um, but if we could do a small work group um, to work through some of these issues before the next meeting, I guess that's where I would like to, to land. Because I think a, a smaller work group, maybe it's through Ken's um, engaging the, the community work group, maybe that's the best place to start it, I'm not sure. I'm open to suggestions, so. That sounds reasonable to me. What do you guys think? I guess uh, if that sounds good to you, I guess do a thumbs up or something or raise a hand or I don't know if people are raising hands to talk or raising hands to because they were in agreement. I support that idea. All right, I'm seeing people raising hands, which I assume mean yes, they're in agreement. So, all right, uh, that feels like a really reasonable approach to me. Let's um, set up a time, Abby, will you send out something? How about if we have people, uh, Abby, if you could send out an email indicating that and yeah. people that are interested in joining the engagement committee 
to be a part of that as long as it doesn't turn into a 60 member committee because that just becomes like a rock and roll tour um yes then then why don't you guys work on clarifying those things moving forward before the next meeting that sound good to people that sounds great maybe we all right can do, uh, um and um ken i'm not sure what your well i'm sure kelly's got the membership list for the that subcommittee but i guess if anybody else is interested in that group um shoot kelly an email and just let us know and then we'll send out a doodle poll or whatever to try to get dates okay and, and whatever dates we come up with in, in for the meetings we got to make sure that those are uh, published as public meetings like in any other subcommittee meeting because it was a concern last time we did this okay Okay, uh, anything Sandy? else? I'm just gonna. Oh, yeah, somebody said Sandy. <laughs> yeah, Sandy, I'm sorry, it's Lynn. Oh, hi, Lynn. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, I think what the group is looking for is very concrete, specific steps. It's not a matter of lining up language. It's, I agree. What are the improvements that have been made? Let's see it on paper. What I think it still need to be done. Let's see that. Let's agree. I can't. The hardest thing for me all of all is the idea that that there's going to be this kind of long drawn out like case specific process when there have to be a few basics that they're always done. And if you're doing them and we don't know about it, it was great that you shared that, Abby, but I want to know that everything's been checked off that list that you think is important and that we think are important. Because I want to know, like Sandy does, that every person is protected. That is the bottom line. That is why I attended tonight. I care about every single potentially affected person. I know you guys do, but make it as specific and concrete as we can. That's it. All right, so I'm assuming at our next meeting, we will talk about the public notification process again, because this small group will meet and clarify the language in that. I'm also guessing there's gonna be some more discussion maybe we wanna have on the biosolids issue and potential food contamination, because that was a pretty good conversation. If there's other ideas that people have, feel free to shoot out an email of things that they would like on the agenda but we're already four minutes over, so I don't want to take up any more time. Daniel, you have your hand up. I don't know if you're just waving at me or if you're. Yeah, so so just two two real quick things. If, if I understood Abby correctly, um, you know, one strategy we've used on other things that I, I feel like might be helpful here is, you know, basically just picking three sites uh, or three issues in the past um, and then kind of walking through the questions on those. So we can do Traverse City, uh, you know, the farm by Howell and, and another site and just try to figure out like what are the communication steps on each of those. I, I feel like that's what would be useful um, to a lot of us just to, to line everything up and, and figure out what those concrete steps are, um, at, at least in some scenarios. The, the other thing I just want to say super quick is I, I feel like I got more intense than I, I meant to be when um, after Stephanie's presentation, I feel like my frustration just kind of stuck to Stephanie more than um, well, my frustration is not with Stephanie. My frustration is with the whole global PFAS system in general. So my, my apologies, Stephanie, if, if I came off harsh, that wasn't my intent. No, you're, you're fine, but thank you, Dan. All right, anything else? If anybody else has something else, bring it up, please. We had a good group today and a lot of discussion. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to talk. Um, this is Mary Blanchard. I just want to remind people that the membership team will be sending out the uh, nomination and the voting aspect and return it by the 22nd, please. Thank you. Are there any other nominees who would like to be on the, uh, you know, be on the ballot for the leadership team? Doesn't sound like it, Connie. <laughs> yep. yep. 
You're right. <laughs> okay, we're closing that door then. Okay, thank All you. Right. Scott, your hands up. Yeah, I uh, I do have my hand up. Uh, I know we're running long, but I, I want to carry it on a little of this money tonight and tell us what he thought of our meeting. I were you asking me? Yes. And I'm sorry I couldn't hear because I think there's some background noise. I thought this was a productive meeting. I think that the uh, the one thing I would notice, and I don't know whether it's Scott or Ken, so I'll go with both of them. Scott and Ken, I'm, I'm I, the same I, I guy. who is participating, and I think that the meeting could be stronger if we heard from members that didn't happen to participate tonight. There are probably about eight that did not participate. There are about um, five or six that participated many times, many meaning four to five times. So I think that the, the wealth of, of expertise and passion in the room is something that should be tapped into as much as possible. But that's just, you know, a general, I think, moving forward. I also believe that the work you guys have done to come up with nominees sets us up so that there'll be a chair and two vice chairs in March. And I think that if we would have guessed that in January, we, we might not have guessed that might happen. So I think it's I think things are moving along. That's my opinion. Thanks, Jerry. So it's you good bet. to have an outsider look in and notice things. Um, somebody else has their hand up. Connie, is your hand really up? No, no, it's okay. not. I'm sorry, right. forgive me. All right. Well, I, I think with that, we're going to call it a night because Abby's waving and we're all tired. So <laughs> I, I propose we extend these to 830. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I'm I kidding. propose you turn off your mic right now and your kids <laughs> need you right now. So all right. A great meeting. Thank you, everybody, for taking up your evening doing this. We're getting there. So have a good evening. Stay warm. Stay Thanks, safe. Sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bye. Sandy.